Hey everyone, and welcome back. What I would like to discuss today are what I consider to be common philosophical failures that I've repeatedly encountered when engaging with Christian apologetics, and that you should be aware of too so that you can learn to recognize them whenever they appear. Now, as I've said many, many times before on my channel, the debate over God's existence, that is to say, the culture war between American Christianity and secularism is more than just some debate between academic or political egos. Whenever I get down to the real, meaty, philosophical core of the issue, what I tend to find is a philosophical battle over how truth itself should be measured and acted upon. So in the one camp, we have people like myself, who maybe we can describe as pragmatic empirical rationalists. So that is to say, people who base their beliefs on things like, oh, physical evidence, logical formalism, and ultimately functional decision making and problem solving. But when it comes to Christian apologetics, the goal is not really to generate functional knowledge, but to engineer conformity. So this is why we constantly see so many appeals to authority or arguments from personal credulity and exploitation of psychological bias. So when the two camps meet together in a public debate, the result is a lot like watching a game of chess being played against an opponent who thinks the game is really checkers. Rather than spend our time engaging in a rational analysis of the facts and evidence toward predictive outcomes, we instead find ourselves butting heads over how to measure the philosophical truth of anything at all in the first place. For example, many of you are no doubt aware of the recent debate between Bill Nye and Ken Ham over evolution. What should have been a back and forth presentation of the evidence in accordance with biological models and the diversity of life was instead a sort of dizzying spiral down a bunch of tedious philosophical rabbit holes. To me, this is a perfect demonstration of why it's impossible to have a rational debate with a Christian apologist because Christian apologists are simply not interested in playing by the rules of reason in the first place. Right? They don't care what biological models are better capable of making testable empirical predictions, because testable empirical predictions have almost no role in their epistemology. What this means for you and me is that if we seriously want to change the way in which Christians think about the nature of God and religion, then we're never going to compel them with rational empirical arguments. Instead, if we really want to make progress in the long term, we need to completely overhaul their entire sense of epistemology and philosophical assumptions. So in an effort to help everyone out there have more productive arguments, I'm going to list what I think are the top five philosophical failures that need to be addressed before anyone can even hope to have a rational discussion against a religious believer. Because if we don't nip these things in the bud from the beginning, then everything else we have to talk about after the fact is just going to be another game of chess against an opponent who thinks this is supposed to be checkers. Okay, so with that in mind, let's get started, beginning with number five, which is a failure to acknowledge the analytic-synthetic distinction. To understand what we mean by this, consider the following propositions. So first we have all bachelors are unmarried, and then we have all bachelors live on earth. This is a classic demonstration of a principle that philosophers call the analytic-synthetic distinction. While the first proposition is essentially just a statement of meaning and definition built into the English language, the second proposition is a claim about the relationship between actual things in the physical world. So if you want to judge the truth of these claims, you quickly find that the rules are fundamentally different. Uh, that is to say, one is not like the other. While the first claim can simply be analyzed from the pure meaning of the words themselves, the second one has to be tested against empirical observation in the real world. Now, you'd think this sort of distinction would be pretty obvious, especially in light of the fact that philosophers have been talking about this stuff for centuries. Yet, for some reason, many, many Christians, including self-proclaimed experts in philosophy, actually have a very hard time applying it. Uh, for example, maybe you've encountered the infamous roadrunner tactic, which is a common rhetorical trick that Christians just love to play. And it usually begins with a typical atheist statement that says something like, uh, in order to justify belief in God, one would first need empirical scientific evidence to support that belief. Okay, so that's a perfectly reasonable statement, to which the Christian then replies, 
Well, what is your scientific evidence that science is true, huh? Checkmate, atheist. Uh, so in other words, the challenge itself is apparently supposed to be unreasonable or self-defeating. The problem with this tactic is that science is not a claim about the external world. Science is a process. We as a people define science through the use of analytic propositions, and then we use science to evaluate the truth of synthetic propositions. So if you happen to like science and the philosophical goals that science seeks to accomplish, then great, go ahead and do science. And if you don't like science as a process for building knowledge, then fine, don't do science. But it's important to understand that science itself is not automatically subject to the actual rules of science. That would be a confusion of analytic versus synthetic propositions. Uh, another great example of this kind of philosophical confusion, in my opinion, is the ontological argument for the existence of God. Now what this argument attempts to show is that the mere concept of God is all it takes in order to logically prove that God exists. But again, this is a confusion of analytic versus synthetic propositions. Logic, like science, is a process. What logic seeks to accomplish is establish certain rules for proper mixing and matching of information contained within propositions. However, pure logic in and of itself cannot magically generate rote facts about the external world through definition alone. Right? That's just not what it does. So it doesn't matter how logical Christians think they're being, because the ontological argument itself is philosophically incapable of achieving the very thing it sets out to do. Synthetic propositions cannot be deduced out of pure ideas alone. They have to be tied to some kind of empirical, predictive modeling or else they're just functionally useless. Moving along to philosophical failure number four, we have massive obsessions with Platonism. In a very broad sense, Platonism is the idea that abstract objects have a real, literal existence under themselves independent of human thought. Uh, for example, we've talked several times before about entities like numbers. You can't see numbers, you can't feel numbers, you can't hold a number in your hand, but they definitely seem to have a real power for describing the world. So if you're a Platonist, the reason is because those numbers are more than just mere ideas, but real legitimate things that exist. Uh, that there is a real trans-dimensional realm beyond space and time where these things reside and exercise their influence over the physical world. Now, as I've tried to point out many times before, that's not how numbers work, even though Christians keep trying to convince us that it is. But when you really get down to the meaty, philosophical core of things, it's easy to see that there's no such thing as a literal number. That is to say, I can speak perfectly well of having two apples or two oranges, but I can never truly speak of having an independent two all by itself. The reason is because a phrase like two apples is actually just a grammatical shorthand for an apple and another apple. Words like two and seven are just fancy tools that allow me to express information in accordance with a nice, compact formalism. So it hardly makes any sense at all to think of an independent two by itself because the word itself is not even technically a noun. We just don't usually notice this because we tend to abuse language by speaking of two as if it were a noun anyway. Now that's just one example, but you might be surprised how often this platonic fallacy thing tends to keep popping up in Christian philosophy. Uh, for instance, how many times have you heard Christians ask things like, how do you, atheist, account for the universal laws of logic? Whenever I hear this challenge, it seems to me that the Christian is seriously implying logic is a kind of intrinsic physical essence of the universe somehow magically woven into the fabric of space and time. But as we already talked about, this is not how logic works. Remember that logic is a process. It's a set of formalized rules that we use to mix and match propositions. If you follow the rules of logic, then you're being logical. And if not, then you're just not being logical. However, we tend to really like logic because logic is a very useful system for organizing information into coherent statements of ideas that other logical people will understand. But there's really nothing metaphysically transcendent about an axiomatic system of epistemology built into our use of language. Which now brings us to failure number three, and that is endless struggles with internal consistency and 
basic coherence. You'd think this would be a simple principle to understand, but it's amazing how often Christians seem to just keep dropping the ball. For example, you've probably heard the famous question, does absolute truth exist? Uh, the answer, of course, is no. Propositions can either be true or false in that they comply with certain axiomatic assertions, but there's no such thing as raw essence of truth all by itself. So to ask if absolute truth exists makes about as much sense as asking if absolute bigness exists. Um, no, it doesn't. Objects can either be big or they can be small, but pure bigness alone is not even something you can meaningfully talk about. Another great example of just pure inconsistency is the whole idea of God himself. That is to say, we have a powerful personal agent that loves you immensely and desperately wants to build a deep emotional connection with you, while at the same time deliberately hides his very existence from you and won't even hesitate to torture you for all eternity merely for failing to believe in the correct version of him. Uh, I'm sorry, Christians, but these are mutually incompatible properties to assign to the same entity. If you can't even define God in a meaningful, coherent, and consistent manner, then by default, whatever you're talking about is wrong and cannot exist. Moving along, we now have failure number two, which is an inability to grasp the burden of proof. Of all the failures I've encountered in religious apologetics, I think this one has to be the most frustrating. Because honestly, this idea is so simple and obvious that it boggles all comprehension when people fail to get it. But basically, all this principle states is that the person making the positive claim is responsible for justifying that claim. Yet for some crazy reason, Christian apologetics habitually fight against this idea. Uh, perhaps you've even encountered examples of this yourself, like when Christians say, you can't prove that God doesn't exist, uh, as if that automatically means he does, or maybe you've heard the claim that there are no good arguments, that atheism is true. So again, as if this were some kind of devastating insight. But of course, the argument is really very simple. All you have to say to the Christian is two words, null hypothesis, and your job is done. That is to say, until such time as Christians learn to define God coherently and then provide compelling physical evidence for his existence, then I am not going to base any of my decisions under the implied expectation of such. It's really just that simple, yet some Christians will just fight tooth and nail against this. To see why this is such a frustrating principle to have to explain, just think about what the world would be like if the burden of proof were reversed. That literally, the moment some guy comes to you with a claim, any claim at all, then you would be obligated to take him completely at his word and act accordingly. And you would then have to continue acting accordingly until such time as you finally exercise your due diligence and prove the claim to be false. Assuming, of course, that the claim itself is even falsifiable to begin with. Obviously, this is a very stupid and impractical way to live your life. All of us employ the null hypothesis principle on a daily basis, and any attempt to argue otherwise is tantamount to an argument in favor of gullible credulity. So always remember, you don't have to disprove God. That job is done for you by default. The onus is on Christians to provide a compelling, positive argument based on testable, empirical predictions. And since to date none of their arguments have been very good, then none of us are under any rational obligations to change our behavior accordingly. Finally, we have our number one philosophical failure of Christian apologetics. Are you ready for this? We have number one, a total rejection of fallibilism. Now I'm placing this one at the top because I think that this is the most ubiquitous and insidious failure in all of Christian philosophy. Basically, all fallibilism means is that it's possible to be wrong about things, and if you're shown to be wrong, then you should change your mind to what is right. Now that might sound straightforward enough, and you'd think that everyone would be on board with this from the onset. But most Christian apologetics will actually reject this principle openly as a matter of doctrine. For example, we have the principle of biblical inerrancy and papal infallibility. Uh, we even saw this exact failure during Ken Ham's debate with Bill Nye. Uh, remember how both candidates were asked, point blank, what would change your mind? 
Ken Ham then stated very publicly and proudly that absolutely nothing would. That truth, by definition, is whatever the Bible says, and therefore the Bible cannot be wrong, and by extension, neither can Ken Ham. Just stop and ask any of your atheist friends, what would it take to convince you that God exists? Most of them would probably give the same answer that Bill Nye did. Evidence. Right? Even the most hardcore among us, even the mighty Richard Dawkins himself, have stated openly that evidence is all we would need. If Christians would simply define God coherently and then provide compelling physical demonstrations of this God's existence, then virtually all of us would happily abandon our atheism and convert to Christianity. Now stop and ask the same thing to Christian apologetics. What would it take to convince you that God does not exist? How do you think they tend to answer? Because oftentimes they'll be very blunt about it, right? Nothing, absolutely nothing can shake them in their faith as if it were philosophically impossible for them to be wrong in their spiritual beliefs. Even when they're not saying it openly, they'll still find ways to say it implicitly anyway. Uh, for example, we've heard William Lane Craig's self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit, that even if all the evidence in the world turned against Christianity, then Craig would still believe because he has the Holy Spirit. And of course, since nothing is allowed to supersede this experience, then the end result is the same. Nothing can change Craig's mind. This is why I think it's perfectly appropriate to say that Christian apologetics are not honest people. They're not interested in better understanding reality. They're just trying to reinforce an a priori conclusion. So please, if you ever get into a serious religious discussion with a Christian, before you do anything else, get them to commit to basic fallibilism. Ask them directly, is it possible that you're wrong? What would it take to convince you that you're wrong? If you were wrong, would you want to know about it so that you can correct your wrongness? All right, these are questions that need to be acknowledged openly or else nothing you say after the fact is going to make any difference. In closing, I hope you found this presentation useful. And if you have any philosophical failures that you've encountered, uh, please feel free to share them and give us examples of how they crop up in your discussions with Christians. Just remember that whenever you engage in religious philosophical debates, it's not about facts and evidence. It's about epistemology. If you can't fix the broken epistemology underneath all those beliefs, then you'll never be able to build a new, rational, free thinker. So good luck in your endeavors, and as always, thank you for watching.